and we did some youth education um, with their summer rec programs. And then we also set up an edible Main Street uh, kind of demonstration in their downtown area. And so Aaron is joining us tonight to talk a little bit more about food forests and their design and he'll get all into that. And so if you did donate to this program, we're very thankful and all of those donations will be going towards maintenance for the food forest in this coming year. And I guess I will turn it over to Aaron, unless David, if you wanted to add anything that I missed, but Aaron, you're all set if you want to start off your presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to have my camera off for most of this time because I'm going to be showing you slides um, and having um, all the all the bandwidth that I have dedicated to audio is um, going to provide better um, better audio quality for you. Um, but I just wanted to start with a little introduction. Uh, my name is Aaron Parker, and I have been working with plants pretty much uh, my whole life. Um, but for the past um, 15 years or so, I have made most of my money uh, doing landscaping professionally. And in the past five years, I've started to transition more towards doing um, education uh, workshops like this. Uh, as well as running Edgewood Nursery, um, which is here in Falmouth, and I specialize in edible and unusual plants. Um, so there's a little bit of background about me, um, and now I'm going to turn off my camera. And Aaron, I, I just want to jump in and add that if anybody does have questions throughout the presentation, please use the chat box and I'll be sending Aaron some text messages with those questions as they come up so that he can continue with the presentation without kind of switching back and forth to see if there's questions. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Jenna. Um, and also, if, if you haven't taken uh, taking a look at the chat box. Also in there, there's a link to a PDF handout for this presentation, which um, hopefully you will find useful. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to <coughs> screen sharing, and hopefully everyone can see uh, my slideshow now. All right. Okay, so I like to start off this uh, presentation talking about what a food forest is and why you might want one. So here's a picture of a food forest, uh, fairly young, but um, established enough to be producing. This is at my house. And if a food forest is a way of laying out a garden that incorporates many different plants growing together um, in a way, in a sort of um, layout and pattern that structurally mimics a naturally occurring forest. Um, so if you can think about being in, in a wooded area and all the different types of plants you might see, you might see large trees, small trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants, vines, all kind of growing together and that's uh, that's what you would expect from a food forest as well. Um, and having all those plants growing together creates a high diversity ecosystem um, that is a healthier ecosystem than you would expect to see in a more agricultural um, monocrop type setting. And the health of the ecosystem really um, makes the cultivation of the plants in it much easier for humans and requires less input and has more uh, sort of fringe benefits to the um, the other animals and plants and all, all the other living things that we share our space with um, as well as the sort of global global community as this type of um, cultivation actually uh, sequesters carbon in the soil and helps to, in some small way, mitigate um, the problems of climate change. 
Um, so food forests are usually designed to produce not just food, uh, but also fiber, fuel, fodder, fertilizer, pharmaceuticals or medicine, uh, and fun. So those are the, the uh, seven Fs of, of the food forest. And we can um, create a system that grows all of these desirable things um, in a regenerative system that really uh, benefits not only the people um, directly interacting, but everyone through um, you know, through sequestering carbon and in improving ecosystem conditions. So when when we think about a food forest, um, it's often described as having several layers, and not all of these layers need to be present um, in order for it to be a food forest. Um, but if if you wanted to fit the sort of maximum diversity possible into any given space, um, this is um, one way to think about doing that. Um, so the the uh, top layer is uh, the canopy. Um, so these are large trees uh, around here. They would usually be nut trees, but they could also be large fruit trees. And you've got the sub canopy or low tree layer. So there are going to be smaller fruit trees. This is the layer where you would expect to find um, stone fruits, apples, stuff like that. Um, the shrub layer. Um, so most berry crops grow on uh, shrubs, um, which are small, multi stemmed woody plants. The herbaceous layer and herbaceous plants are plants that die back to the ground every year. Um, uh, and then usually they're perennial herbaceous plants, which means that they die back to the ground and then pop up again the next spring. Um, the rhizosphere, uh, which we'll talk more about later, is the, the underground layer where all the roots are. And then the soil surface or ground cover layer. And then you've also got vertical layers where you might find vines and climbers. Um, now, within these layers, um, there are many different niches um, of plants. And any given plant within uh, the forest garden system um, is likely to have several different functions or ecosystem services. Um, and the first ecosystem service that um, that I'm going to talk about is what some people call beneficial accumulators or insectary plants. Um, so these are plants whose flowers especially cater to beneficial insects, like this brachinoid wasp. Um, and the reason, uh, kind of getting a question here, it says, is there a copy of that image of the tree levels available. Um, so any uh, anyone who wants any of the images from um, from the slideshow, make sure that you get a copy of the handout and then just send me an email um, and I can email you any of uh, any of these images. Um, so this image is a brachinoid wasp. And the reason that you would particularly want to attract a wasp like this is because this is how they reproduce. Um, they lay their eggs in caterpillars, and then the caterpillars get eaten from the inside out, and you get more wasps. Um, so for almost every type of pest insect, there is some sort of beneficial insect um, that eats that, uh, that pest. And by having really high diversity, you're never ever going to eliminate pest issues. That's just, you know, pests are kind of a, a function of, of the ecosystem. They're, 
um, you're never going to get that down to nothing. But by having a lot of predators that eat those pests um, or parasites that parasitize the pests or uh, parasitoids, which is what this is, a parasitoid being a parasite that kills the host, um, you can keep the pest pressure low enough that it's usually not something that you need to take care of um, with um, you know, hand picking pest insects or um, spraying a pesticide or what have you. So hopefully by encouraging and building diversity, you can avoid having to do those um, types of either unpleasant labor or environmentally destructive practices. Um, another uh, ecosystem service or function um, is um, what some people call the dynamic accumulators. And um, the idea behind dynamic accumulators is that some plants are particularly well suited to sending their roots down to the subsoil or making connections with um, specific soil bacteria and fungi to be able to extract mineral nutrients from the soil and accumulate those resources in the stems and leaves of the plant. And the uh, plant in the foreground of this um, slide is um, a type of comfrey called Bocking 14 comfrey. And comfrey is renowned for its ability to pick up large amounts of a wide variety, a variety of mineral nutrients. And um, so the way this plant functions in the ecosystem is it um, brings up all these uh, mineral nutrients, accumulates them in, the, them in the stems and leaves, and then when those stems die, um, those minerals get kind of recycled into the topsoil and become available to um, all the other um, plants in that area. And you can just let that happen naturally, or you can take a more active role um, and you could cut the dynamic accumulator plant down several times um, in a practice that people call chop and drop mulching or chop and drop fertilizing, where you just chop down the dynamic accumulator plant and drop it on the ground. And you could get even more uh, active in that process by bringing um, comfrey leaves or whatever the material is from one area to another where maybe that fertility is needed more. Um, and examples of that could be um, just bring it to a different bed or bring it to a compost pile to add mineral nutrients to the compost or feeding it to your chickens um, and then using the chicken manure to fertilize areas. Um, so by utilizing dynamic accumulator plants, you are maximizing the amount of sort of on-site nutrition that you can uh, gain. So instead of bringing nutrients in um, from off-site, you can hopefully grow, grow that fertilizer on-site, um, which is obviously in environmentally and economically um, much better. Um, comfrey really is a, a great plant. Um, a lot of people are kind of scared of it because uh, there are certain types of comfrey that tend to seed in all over the place. And once comfrey is established in a spot, it is extremely difficult to get rid of, um, which is why I like this Bocking 14 comfrey because uh, they don't seed in. Um, and once you plant them in a spot, they're gonna be there forever, but they don't spread. Um, and in this slide, you can see um, comfrey sort of at the end of spring when they're about four feet tall and covered in flowers, uh, which are quite pretty, and the, the bees really appreciate those as well. Um, another type of fertilizer um, that can be grown on site is nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is often the limiting factor in, in plant growth um, because it's kind of a ephemeral nutrient. Um, it uh, is kind of also this weird conundrum that it um, can be biologically rare in some cases because when every time you breathe in 
the vast majority of what you're breathing in is nitrogen. Um, but in the atmosphere, um, the nitrogen is in this form of N2. So it's two nitrogen atoms that are really closely bonded together. And they're basically inert. Um, so it's it takes a lot of energy to be able to break those apart and turn them into something that is biologically available. Um, and there are bacteria that can do this with, with help from plants. And so theoretically, under ideal conditions, any plant should be able to get um, all of the nitrogen that it needs um, from free living uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil. But um, you can almost never count on any condition to be ideal. So uh, when, when you're designing a, um, a forest garden or any regenerative system, it can be very useful to design in some plants that are particularly good at um, working with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So this picture is of um, a Siberian pea shrub or Carigana arborescens. Um, and many, many plants in the Fabaceae or pea family um, have this adaptation to make nodules on their roots. And inside of that nodule lives nitrogen fixing bacteria. And so the nodule kind of makes ideal conditions for those bacteria to do their work. And the plants use sugars that they make through photosynthesis uh, to feed the, um, feed those bacteria to give them the energy to fix nitrogen. Um, and then that nitrogen um, can be found in the rest of the plant. And to some degree, it might get shared into the rest of the system. So you might be able to get um, nitrogen to adjacent plants. Um, but just by having these nitrogen fixing plants around, but you can also use that same chop and drop technique that I talked about with, with the comfrey with nitrogen fixing plants, um, that allows that, that nitrogen to be taken from, uh, a plant like a pea shrub or, um, vetch or any other nitrogen fixing, um, plant and, you know, spread it around within within the system of the forest garden. Um, ornamental is a, a nice attribute for um, forest garden plants. Uh, when I first started forest gardening, I pretty much only planted plants that were edible. Um, and then after a while, I, I realized that having some plants that were there specifically uh, for cut flowers or just to be aesthetically appreciated was was actually a good idea. So um, just because you are designing an edible forest garden doesn't mean that you need to um, get rid of plants that are, you know, their their primary function is there to be pretty. Uh, human food, obviously, that's that's the main. Um, service that we're looking for from a edible forest garden. It's right there in the name, edible. Um, and there are lots and lots of different um, plants that can produce food in, in a system like this. Um, in, um, in my garden, there's probably around 200 um, species of plants under cultivation. And I would say somewhere around three quarters of them have some edible part. And you know, sometimes that's the leaves, sometimes that's the fruit, sometimes that's the roots. Um, frequently it's multiple parts. Um, but that's obviously a big, a big consideration. Um, lots of medicinal plants grow well in forest garden conditions. And I think the last ecosystem service that we're going to talk about in this section is aromatic pest confuser. Um, so this plant in the picture is called tansy. Um, not a plant I would 
recommend for an ornamental garden, but a really nice plant for a forest garden. And the reason, uh, or the primary reason that you might plant some tansy is uh, it's very aromatic. Um, you can you can smell it just walking past, and if you crush up a, a little bit of leaf in your hand, you smell it really strongly. And the idea behind aromatic pest infusers is that pest insects um, are not visually oriented. Um, so we as humans, like if, if I want to look around and find an apple tree, I look with my eyes and I know what the sort of visual signature of an apple tree looks like. And I can scan the landscape and in any season I can recognize an apple tree. Um, that's not really how insects work. Insects are much more tuned in to chemical senses. Um, so they're able to sense the chemical signature of uh, whatever their host plant is. And just by growing plants in polyculture, where instead of just you know a whole orchard full of one type of apple, um, you might have you know a, a forest garden like mine where there's m multiple hundreds of species, just by having all those chemical signatures mixed up, um, it makes it substantially harder for pest insects to find their target species, and that reduces pest pressure to some degree. But there are some plants like tansy or like mint or like bee balm that put out a lot of aromatic chemicals. And the more of those you have floating around, the more it confuses those chemical sensing um, antennae that um, insects rely on to find their host plants. Um, and just like with the uh, dynamic accumulators, you can kind of let these plants coexist and do their thing and hopefully get some effect. Um, but you can also take a much more active role and um, probably get a larger effect. Um, so my friend Tom Vigue, um who has been growing vegetables on the same plot of land since the 1970s, uh, has been experimenting with making tansy tea. And so he'll collect up a bucket of tansy uh, foliage and stems and flowers and kind of crush it up in a five gallon bucket and pour some hot water on it. And then he strains out the plant material and sprays the resulting tea onto his vegetables that he wants to protect, um, and especially on potatoes. And he has um, been able to completely um, avoid having to deal with Colorado potato beetle, which is usually a very annoying insect pest, um, by sort of masking the chemical signature of the potato plant with this tansy tea. Um, so it's not an insecticide. It doesn't kill the beetles. It just prevents them from finding the host plant. And, you know, it's not a, a perfect thing. You have to redo it. Um, but it doesn't cost anything. And the, the time investment to make and apply the tea is lower than dealing with the inevitability of, um, of picking off uh, potato beetle larvae. So just just something to think about um, as a, a possibility of one strategy for avoiding insect pests. OK, so if you're familiar with forest ecology at all, um, there's this idea of forest succession. And before I get into that, I'll look at this next question. And the question is, are there any tansy varieties that are easy to control slash don't take over? Um, and there is a possibility that there are. There is actually a native tansy um, that is very rare here in Maine, but is native to northern Maine. Um, and I am very interested to try growing it this year um, because I suspect that um, it's much less aggressive than the uh, European tansy. Um, but that's there there currently aren't any commercial sources for those seeds, and it, it'll be at least a year before um, I have any of those available to sell. 
um, and probably I'll want to kind of experiment with it for multiple years before um, I really push that one out. Um, but there is a management strategy that makes Tansy very easy to deal with. Um, I have not found that Tansy really spreads by rhizome very much. Maybe just a little bit. Um, so if you just hit, um, which means as the um, as the flowers start to pass, but before seeds are set, um, you just cut the whole top off the plant, and you know you can throw that in your compost pile. Um, then the tansy doesn't spread, and you could uh, if if you're harvesting it to make tansy tea or anything like that. Um, it will almost certainly never get out of hand. Um, so the the problems with tansy are mostly like if you had it near um, a cultivated space, like a vegetable garden or any anywhere where there's any sort of bare soil, and you accidentally let it go to seed, and all those seeds blew into that bare soil, that would be a big mess. Um, but if you avoid letting the tansy set seed or keep it at least well away from any um, really open areas where there's um, not a heavy mulch or good ground cover, um, then you should be fine. But um, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it near a vegetable garden. Um, and the name of that technique is called deadheading. So once the flowers die back, you um, cut the top off. Okay, so back to succession. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so succession is the change in an ecosystem over time. Um, and the... Um, what, what's being shown in this very interesting slide um, that I found on Wiki Commons um, is succession starting at bare rock and a climax forest. So if you had a absolutely catastrophic wildfire or a meteor impact or something that's going to just kill everything in a given spot, um, that would be a, a large disturbance. Um, and you can see some um, little icons over here that show disturbances like fire, humans, tsunami, uh, nuclear blast. Um, that kind of clears the slate. And a disturbance doesn't necessarily need to bring succession back to zero. Uh, in fact, a lot of forest garden management has to do with Mine, creating minor disturbances to keep the forest garden in the stage of succession where you want it. Um, but the idea of natural succession is you've got a disturbance and that could potentially you know, bring you back to zero, bare rock. Uh, the first um, organisms, plants that can grow on bare rock are mosses and lichens, followed by grasses. Um, so then we're over here. Grasses are followed by um, perennials and then would be pioneer species. So like fast growing trees and especially shrubs. And then you get young woodlands full of fast growing trees. So those would be like um, birches, poplars, pines are all sort of pioneer species. Um, for our ecosystem, and then the sort of uh, end of end of the line is climax forest, and so around here um, that could be those pines can actually stick around, but oaks, maples, um, hemlock are you know these trees that can live for hundreds and hundreds of years um, and get really massive size. Um, so I'm getting a, a little uh, notification that pops up once in a while um, that says that I have a poor um, 
poor connection quality. Can can everyone hear me OK? Uh, Jenna, if you want to chime in for just a second, let me know if um, if you can hear me. You're it's kind of the voice is cutting out a little bit here and there, but it's not been like very consistent. So okay. most of the time we can hear you fine. <laughs> All right, cool. I, I will proceed and feel free to jump in if I cut out for more than a second. OK. All right, so the idea of succession is important to at least kind of understand when you're thinking about um, forest garden planning. Because like any ecosystem, the designed ecosystem of a forest garden um, will experience succession over time. Um, let's see. Um, and a, a really good example of that succession is um, if you're planting a forest garden on what is essentially cleared ground, like let's say you have a lawn and you're going to convert it over to a forest garden. You're going to start with some very young trees that don't cast much shade. Um, and all that space around the trees um, is going to be very sunny, suitable for annual vegetable production or growing plants that do well in full sun. But as the trees get larger and start to really fill in, um, all that space around them will become shaded. Um, so the, um, the population of other plants around the trees will need to shift over time. Um, so that, you know, for a period of many years or even decades, um, there's always a little bit of replanting or moving plants around a bit to help sort of um, manage the forest garden as, as conditions change. Um, and like I said about um, managing with disturbance, sometimes um, if you want to make sure that sunny patches don't completely disappear from the forest garden, uh, that might mean disturbing it. Um, again, and that could mean removing a tree um, if they get too crowded or pruning or, you know, some other type of management practice. Um, all right, so um, before you even think about what um, type of plants you would like to have in your forest garden, um, thinking a bit about how you would like the plants to be arranged is, is really important. Um, so in this picture, what we see is a multi-layer forest. Um, and that kind of, um, this is kind of an example of um, what, uh, what was being described in that black and white drawing where it showed all the different layers. So I think you can probably see the, the cursor so we've got tall trees here. These are the canopy trees. Uh, there are shrubs over here. Uh, there are vines that are growing up the trees. And then down here on the ground, there are some herbaceous forbs, which are non-grass herbaceous plants. And then over here, you can see some grasses growing as well. Um, and obviously, all, all these plants are interacting with the, the rhizosphere under, under the around here um, it is one of the more complex arrangements of plants um, that that you could imagine in our type of ecosystem Aaron can you repeat that last part yes um, so this is a multi-layer uh, forest system. Um, it's very much like the black and white drawing um, where we've got the canopy, sub canopy, shrub layer, vines, and all of those layers are also interacting with um, the rhizosphere or soil layer. Uh, and there's also the herbaceous layer present. Could you hear it that time? 
Okay, cool. And it's another picture of um, uh, multi-layer forest where you can really see the canopy of these large trees um, and then also the sub canopy of the much shorter trees growing completely underneath them. Um, so that's what that's what most people think of when they think of forest. Uh, there are other other types of ecosystem that we can look to as potential models. Um, and here is a a multi-layer edible forest garden. And I think we've already seen that picture, so I won't linger on it too much. All right, so this is a type of tree ecosystem called a savanna. Um, this is the sort of classic African acacia savanna. Um, and a savanna is a, um, a ecosystem that is, um, has lots of trees present, but they're typically widely spaced. Um, and the um, areas in between them are usually filled with grasses and shrubs. Um, and here's a more North American type savanna. This is an oak savanna. Um, and when we think of edible forest gardens that mimic savannas, um, the most uh, typical or most commonly used idea is something called silvopasture. And silvopasture incorporates um, some type of tree crop, uh, often nut trees or fruit trees, uh, with grass that is meant to be grazed by animals. Um, so you can have both pasture and um, tree crops growing together. Um, and rather than trying to grow lots of different kinds of um, vegetable food, like you would see in this multi-story forest garden, you could grow the, the tree crops like here and then have animal products being produced along with those trees. Uh, and another way to lay out a uh, edible forest garden is a strategy called alley cropping. Um, and the idea um, with alley cropping is that you've got these widely spaced rows of trees uh, like you have here, and there could be those could be multi-layer plantings. These appear to be just single rows of trees without any understory, but you could uh, also have shrubs or herbs or vines growing with them. And then you've got the alley, which is a, um, a much sunnier area where you might have um, annual crops. And this looks like it's corn. It's not a great quality picture. Um, here's another, uh, another view of a similar alley crop where you've got uh, what looks like nut trees with grains growing in between them. Um, so that's these are substantially simpler um, layouts than the uh, the multi-layer where you can see that's um, you know it's kind of chaotic but there's there's probably about 40 plus species of plants growing together uh, in that picture compared to um, probably three or four in that picture and looks like two in that picture. <coughs> All right. Um, once you figure out um, how, how you would like to have your forest garden uh, laid out, um, it can be very useful to have a, you know, a drawn out plan like this. Um, unless you're a real artist, it probably won't look quite as nice as this. Um, mine never do. Um, and just because you have a plan doesn't mean you need to follow it exactly. I, I always like to have, have a plan for everything. Uh, but I never follow it exactly when uh, when it actually comes down to it. Um, 
And I think a lot of what uh, what I wanted people to see in this slide uh, was this area right here labeled food forest. And the reason I wanted you to see that is it's a really nice um, representation of there is a large nut tree right here. Um, so you can see that there, um, the canopy of this single tree covers several shrubs. So these uh, smaller dark green spots are all shrubs. And then the light green ovals are beds of perennials. Um, so that's just a nice visual of, of how um, large trees um, or smaller trees, like over here, can be integrated with shrubs and herbaceous beds completely under the canopy of, of the large tree. Um, and when you're thinking about how to lay out all these plants, um, a really important uh, thing to think about is a concept called resource partitioning. And this slide shows uh, the different root patterns of several different types of plants. Um, so you might get something with a taproot system like a carrot. Um, like this one, or you might get something with a really fibrous root system like this. So this is more like the, uh, the root system of tansy. And when you get all these different root systems growing together, um, you can see in this picture that they're not really competing for space too much. The trees are able to reach way down deep um, and um, hopefully be able to get the water and nutrients from down deep while the smaller plants um, are able to access um, water and nutrients closer to the surface. Um, in reality, tree roots will also have a lot of feeder roots right up near the surface. Um, so there, there is a certain amount of trial and error in trying to figure out how how resources are being partitioned um, and the resources um, that we are talking about are especially um, three things they're light um, water and soil nutrition um, and so as you are arranging um, plants, it's really important to think about how is this plant going to get what it needs as far as light, water, and soil nutrition. So if, um, if you're working with a, a weak soil that you have amended with compost and mulch, that means that all of the, the real nutrition of that soil is going to be up, up in that top amended layer. Um, and if you have real gravelly soil, uh, that drains super quickly. That means that water is going to potentially be scarce. Um, and if you have a, a big tree that casts a lot of shade, that means that light underneath that tree is going to be a scarce resource. So you need to um, think about the various needs of uh, the various plants um, and try and arrange them in such a way that they're not competing too much. Um, and um, there, there definitely is a, a lot of trial and error. There, um, there's this concept, um, especially in permaculture design, where people talk about guilds. Um, and the, the way that I usually hear it defined is a guild is a polyculture that works. Um, and a polyculture is when, uh, when you're growing multiple types of plants together in the same space. Uh, and if those plants are able to share space and um, not have negative um, interactions, um, then you could call that group of plants a guild. Um, and what I mean by negative interactions is let's 
say you plant three plants together and they're A, B, and C, and plant A does really well and grows all over everywhere and the other two plants die. That polyculture didn't really work out. Um, but if all the plants grow successfully together and potentially even um, have some particular benefit that one plant can offer another, like um, the dynamic accumulator effect or the um, uh, nitrogen fixation or something like that, then we could call that a guild. And there's a question that says, is there a single resource to be able to see the root patterns of many different plants? And the answer is, if, um, if there is, I don't know about it. Um, but um, that's something you can learn really easily by growing these plants. Um, and you're you're welcome to um, send me a text or an email if you've ever got questions about what the root pattern of something is like. Uh, but really, the best way um, to learn that is um, by growing the plant. And at some point, you're probably going to dig it up, and then you'll see exactly how the roots grow. Um, and there, like I said, there's a, a, a lot of trial and error with building polycultures. So if you plant, you know, a bunch of plants together and one of them is struggling, um, I, I wouldn't recommend giving up on that plant, but I would recommend moving it. Um, so uh, with, with a little care, most plants, especially when they're young, um, can be successfully transplanted. Um, don't want to do it in in the heat of the summer, but in spring and fall, they usually transplant pretty well. Um, and so, if if you've got a polyculture that's not quite working out, you know, it's it's always a good idea to dig up the plants that are struggling and try them somewhere else in some other combination, um, in in some other area. All right, so I'm going to move on to. Um, a little bit about planting a food forest. And um, most of this session is going to be about a technique called sheet mulching um, that I think is really um, the way to go as far as establishing new beds. Uh, but there is one problem that's a pretty common problem um, that sheet mulching does not fix, and that is the problem of compaction. Um, now, the uh, soil is, or at least should be, full of all sorts of living organisms. Um, these are bacteria, fungi, and archaea. Um, and having lots of those organisms living happily in your soil um, is the only way that um, plants can really um, access water and nutrition properly and if your plants are able to access water and nutrition easily uh, through a connection with a living soil like that it really makes um, the amount of work that you need to do much much less and in order um, for those um, that soil biology to live happily um, they need um, water and air and in order to get that um, there there needs to be sort of an open structure in the soil and walking over soil and especially driving machinery over the soil tends to kind of smash all the the little tiny airways out of the soil and ruin its structure over time um, and the sort of worst case scenario um, of that is called hard pan compaction. Um, so if you uh, try to dig a hole in the area where, um, where you would like to plant a garden, and it's like digging through concrete, um, then you've probably got compaction issues. And um, a, a little bit of light compaction can actually be solved um, by sheet mulching. 
Um, but real compaction uh, just doesn't doesn't get fixed through sheet mulching alone. And the picture or the uh, tool in this picture uh, is called a broad fork. And it's a great way on a small to medium scale to get rid of compaction. Um, also, a spading fork or a garden fork um, is that you know does the same thing. Um, and all all you need to do is stick the the tines of of your fork into the ground and just kind of wiggle them a little bit. You don't need to actually dig up the soil, which would um, ca actually cause a lot of damage to that soil biology. You just need to kind of break up the compaction a bit. Um, so spading fork, broad fork, both good ways to do that mechanically. Um, if it was a, a really large scale that you were working on, you could use a tractor with a subsoil plow. And that would have basically the same, same effect. Um, and one other way to deal with compaction that I'll mention is something called biotillage. Uh, which is where you plant a cover crop of taprooted plants um, like forage radishes, daikons, or parsnips. And those um, plant roots are actually able to reach down into the compacted soil and break it up a little bit. Um, and you usually just leave them there to rot. And then you get these sort of um, these holes in the compaction um, where that root was, and that really can um, help help to allow air and water and biology to move move through that area of soil again. Um, so once you have assessed your area uh, that you want to turn into a forest garden for compaction, and um, if compaction is present, you've done something to remedy it. Oh, and I'll uh, I'll just put in one. One plug for broad forks. That's a wonderful tool. Um, if um, if you feel like you'll be using it a lot, it might be worth buying one yourself. But they are quite expensive, uh, especially uh, my preferred brand that you see here, the Meadow Creature. It's a very expensive tool. Um, so if you can borrow one from someone, um, that's always a great option, and one place where I know that you can borrow one is the main tool library. Um, there's a fairly small membership fee to join that, and you can get access to a broad fork and many other expensive tools that you don't necessarily need to own yourself, but are really handy to have access to. All right, so once you have dealt with any compaction issues. Um, the basic idea of sheet mulching is that you will mow down any unwanted um, plants in the area. So that could be grass, it could be um, shrubs, trees, whatever it is, you just have to cut it down. Um, and I have successfully sheet mulched over um, a forsythia hedge that was about 12 feet tall um, and I cut it down with a chainsaw and sheet mulched it out and it never came back um, and I have sheet mulched out um, probably acres of um, lawn in the uh, like 16 years that I've been using this technique. Um, so the basic idea is you mow it, you cover it with some sort of sheet layer and that sheet layer is usually either cardboard or seven layers or more of newspaper. And then that sheet layer gets covered with some sort of mulch, um, most commonly wood chips, but whatever type of mulch you want to use is usually fine. And then in addition to those um, basics, it's also a great time to um, add um, add anything that's missing in the soil. Um, so co finished compost is a wonderful thing to add to basically any condition. Um, specific mineral fertilizers can be very useful if there's um, a, a known lack of something. So if, if you did a soil test and you're really low on calcium, then maybe you want to add some lime into your sheet mulch. Um, 
it's also a great time to kind of get rid of organic waste material. So if you've got a big pile of leaves, you can incorporate that into your um, into your sheet mulch or, you know, you got went to the beach and picked up a load of um, seaweed. That's a great material to add to sheet mulch. So you can sort of layer in whatever um, sort of material you want. Um, so this picture is from Mount Joy Orchard in Portland. Mount Joy is a free to pick community orchard um, in a park in Portland. Um, this is right off of Washington Ave. And in this picture, uh, there is a little baby tree right here. And this is all finished compost that we've spread. And you can see it's in sort of a pattern. You can also see someone using a broad fork over in the left hand side. Um, and the reason for this pattern is everywhere where you see this dark compost, that's going to be um, a bed. And everywhere where you still see the grass, that's going to be path. So we're not, we don't want to waste our, our precious compost on the path where there's not going to be um, that much growing, um, although the, the tree roots will still be under there. Um, so we kind of um, use, use the, uh, the limited amount of compost that we have in the most important areas. And if you look right here, you can also see <clears throat> a bunch of brown fall leaves. Um, so this sheet mulch was grass with brown leaves on top of it, and then compost on top of the leaves, and then cardboard on top of the compost, and newspaper um, around the edges of the cardboard, because cardboard doesn't always bend into shapes very easily. So you put the cardboard across most of it and then anywhere where there's a transition, um, you can use some newspaper to make that transition easier. Um, and then wood chips across the whole top of it. And one really important detail is that whenever you have two um, you know, pieces of cardboard or newspaper or whatever joining, uh, it's important that there be an overlap. Because uh, if there's like even just a little crack um, in between the two pieces, the grass that you're hoping to smother out with that sheet layer will find its way and then just pop up right there. So you need to have a, a really solid sheet layer. Um, so another view and then these are those beds um, two years later um, and these beds uh, were heavily planted shortly after being sheet mulched with um, with perennials and then they were maintained for just a few hours once a month um, and you can see there's quite a bit of space there um, and they they really look pretty nice um, so I've got a um, question here how long did it take the forsythia to die back after sheet mulching over it um, and I think it probably took about a season um, for something as established and hardy as a forsythia um, I would, what I did was I cut it down and then I put three layers of cardboard over the stump areas and one layer of cardboard over, you know, all the other areas around the stump. Um, and I never, never really had much popping up. Um, there was like maybe a few stems here or there that got pruned back. Um, so I assume by the end of of that season, um, the forsythia was pretty much dead. And then next question, can you use manure that isn't quite composted yet? Um, and I would say yes. Um, that's a, a great, um, a great way to deal with manure that's like not really finished, um, is to incorporate it into a sheet mulch, uh, especially if it you know it should be underneath the sheet layer because 
a lot of times manure that's not well composted will have weed seeds with it and you want those weed seeds to be underneath a layer of cardboard so they don't pop up. Um, the caveat for using uncomposted manure is that if you use finished compost, you can plant into it right away. If you've got unfinished compost or raw manure or kind of composted manure, you probably want to just let that sit for a month or two um, so it can kind of finish breaking down um, before it's really ready to plant. Um, so the reason that sheet mulching, um, well, there's lots of reasons that I like it, but one, one of them is that once you do a sheet mulch, you've got about a year grace period where there's minimal weed pressure. Um, and in, in the context of a perennial garden or an edible forest garden, that gives you a chance to fill up the space like we did here at Mount Joy with as many perennials as possible um, and let them get established with without much competition from weeds. And then by the time the cardboard or newspaper is all broken down um, and the weeds can maybe start to creep in a little bit, all the, uh, the plants that you planted that you really want to be there um, have gotten established and there's not a ton of room left for weeds to grow. Um, and sheet mulching can also be done on a sort of as needed basis. So rather than trying to put out, you know, a, a thousand square feet of sheet mulching at once, um, if you've got just a little area, um, that got really overrun with weeds, you can just cover just that area. Um, so rather than spending a whole bunch of time digging up weeds and pulling weeds, you can just usually sheet mulch them out. Um, it doesn't work super well on quack grass. Um, it does kind of work, but it's not as effective as it is with most plants. Um, and the reason for that is quack grass has a really sharp terminal bud on the end of its rhizome, which is how it spreads. And that little um, sharp bud can actually poke through the sheet layer really easily. Um, but for most weeds, it's very effective. Um, you can also, um, if you're just planting a tree, say, you might use a single piece of cardboard like the one in the foreground of this picture and just do a little tiny sheet mulch right around the tree just to uh, um, kind of give it an edge and let it get a step. Uh, one thing I will say about um, big sheet mulches versus small is the larger they are, the more effective they are because weeds tend to creep in from the edges, if you've got a really big, one really big space, um, you've got a lot less edge for the weeds to creep in on than if you have 10 little sheet mulches. And here's another view of a sheet mulch at Mount Joy. This one incorporates not only uh, woody plants, but perennials and also annuals and biennials um, so you can you can plant almost anything into a, a sheet mulched bed and, and have some pretty good success um, this is another example of that succession where we sheet mulched this bed there was lots of empty space lots of sun so there was room for plants like tomatoes kale ground cherry sunflowers to grow happily um, this is a, from a few years ago, and now probably none of those, oops, um, none of those plants would grow very well in this spot because um, the trees and shrubs have grown so much that they wouldn't get adequate sun um, to be able to grow happily. All right, um, soil food web. This is um, another reason to use sheet mulching rather than um, double digging or tillage or anything like that that really disturbs and degrades the, uh, the quality of the soil. Um, the soil food web describes the ecosystem that um, supports 
all um, or at least most uh, terrestrial ecosystems. Um, and the way that normally works is the base, the primary producer in the ecosystem is the plants. And plants are really, really good at um, making sugar. And so sugar is made from photosynthesis. So it uses the energy of the sun um, to combine hydrogen um, and water or hydrogen from the air. Uh, I'm sorry, carbon from the air, hydrogen from water and some mineral nutrients from the soil um, to make sugar. And the waste product is oxygen that we need to breathe, as do all animals. And <clears throat> there's this really amazing phenomenon where plants are great at making sugar and they make a lot of it. And more than half, in many cases, of the sugar that a plant makes is actually exuded into the soil. Um, and that is, is there specifically to feed fungi and bacteria. And it, there's a sort of economy that happens here where the plants are feeding sugar to the fungi and bacteria. Um, and in exchange, they're getting nutrients and water. So plants that um, make associations with um, mycorrhizal fungi um, have approximately a um, hundred times as much surface area to work with to draw in um, water and nutrients. And both fungi and bacteria are able to make enzymes and um, other chemicals that solubilize mineral nutrients um, out of the soil that the plants would otherwise not have access to. Um, so the, um, the soil biology is really getting its energy from the plants, um, but the plants wouldn't be able to function particularly well without having, um, uh, having access to the water and nutrition made available by fungi and bacteria. Um, and all these other parts, the protozoa, the nematodes, the arthropods, um, their, their roles are largely in um, keeping nutrients cycling. Um, so if you think about uh, nutrients in a natural ecosystem, those ecosystems generally never run out of nutrients. And it's not that there's an endless amount of anything on Earth. Um, it's more that the nutrients are always cycling around and around and around. Um, so as nutrients are picked up by fungi and bacteria, um, those fungi and bacteria are sometimes eaten by protozoa or nematodes. And those can be eaten by arthropods or other nematodes. Um, and as those um, uh, organisms eat each other and excrete waste and die and reproduce, um, all of that keeps, uh, keeps the nutrients in the soil and keeps them cycling and moving and uh, bioavailable rather than getting you know, washed away or otherwise lost. So by um, supporting the soil food web, we support good plant and ecosystem health. And um, when we have healthy plants and healthy ecosystems, that uh, helps produce uh, good food for humans and healthy humans. Um, so some ways that we can support a healthy soil food web in our gardens are, um, well, the, it really boils down to don't screw it up. Um, and the ways that humans frequently screw up the soil food web um, are compaction. So in areas where your, your crop plants are growing, you don't 
want to be walking over that soil uh, or especially running machinery over it. So having dedicated paths and staying on the garden path whenever possible is generally a good idea. Sometimes you do need to step off the path and that's okay, but you want to uh, keep most of the foot traffic in the path. Um, tillage is really damaging to the soil food web. Um, bacteria, these little uh, microscopic one-celled organisms um, can rebound from tillage pretty quickly, but fungi tend to take the shape of large networks, um, and those networks get chopped up and easily destroyed through tillage. So minimizing any kind of tillage activity um, or completely eliminating it um, is very helpful to the soil food web. And um, we can avoid tillage by using tools like broad forks or spading forks or biotillage um, to break up compaction, which is one function of tillage, and using sheet mulching to eliminate weeds and other unwanted vegetation um, instead of using tillage to do that. Um, avoiding using any type of poisons, so pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, anything with side on the end um, is gonna have a negative impact on the soil food web. So we like to try and avoid that whenever possible. Um, and by building healthy ecosystems, hopefully we're already minimizing the need for any of those um, toxic chemicals. Um, and then um, another thing is keeping the soil covered at all times. Um, all of these little tiny microscopic organisms um, tend to get fried by the rays of the sun pretty quickly. So if the soil is not covered with living plants, um, it should really be covered with um, something, probably dead plants. And so that's what we call mulch. Um, and there's basically any type of dead plant material that is handy, it makes a fine mulch. Um, wood chips, tree leaves, um, dead grasses in the form of lawn clippings, or hay or straw all make fine mulches. Um, if you do use hay as a mulch, um, some people don't like it because it um, always has weed seeds in it, um, but that's really not much of a problem if you put it on thick. So a thick hay mulch is great, will suppress weeds. A light sprinkling of hay mulch is asking for a bed of weeds. All right, so that is most, that's pretty much it for my slides for um, designing and implementing um, the forest garden. Um, and I have a whole bunch of slides and information about recommended uh, plant species. Um, but before I move on to that. Um, I want to say one quick thing about working with water and how water moves across the landscape makes a really big difference um, to um, how, how plants are going to grow in that landscape. And usually around here, um, what um, what we want to do is slow the movement of water and allow it to infiltrate the soil. Um, so anywhere where you see large amounts of water running off your landscape, um, that is an opportunity to maybe change some topography a little bit um, and um, allow that water to slow down and sink into the ground and be stored in the soil um, for plants to be able to access later. Um, and there's lots of ways to do that that we can't get too, uh, too deep in the weeds about. Um, but swales um, are essentially ditches that go along the contour lines of the landscape 
um, and just allow the water to stop and infiltrate. And you can do the same thing um, with berms or even um, just rotten logs laid across the path of, uh, of runoff. And that kind of creates uh, a spot where water will puddle and infiltrate. So just kind of watching, especially um, watching during a spring rainstorm as the last of the snow is melting or any time um, that you have an opportunity to observe the runoff um, from your garden site, uh, it's a good, a good time to uh, try and figure out where the water is going now and how you can um, maybe make some changes um, to keep the water on site. All right, any questions about all that stuff before we move on to talking about uh, particular plant species? All right, so um, we are at seven. We've got a fair bit of time left. And I have plenty of slides and information to share with you about recommended um, species for the forest garden. And we'll start with oaks. Um, Oaks are all around us here in Maine. They're super common um, and a really underutilized food source. Um, acorns do need some processing uh, to be human edible, but once you um, have, have those skills to process them, they're really abundant and really tasty, um, tasty resource. They're usually um, made into acorn flour which has a, a very nutty flavor, unsurprisingly, um, and can be mixed with wheat flour to make all sorts of um, baked goods or hot cereal or many, many different um, food items. Um, uh, um, yeah, these are hickory nuts, uh, which is another large shade nut tree um, and hickories tend to have really hard shells, um, which can make them a little bit difficult to process for food as a nut. There are, um, many improved varieties that you can crack like a walnut, um, and eat that way. Uh, but traditionally hickories have been, um, used to make more of a nut milk. Um, so if you familiar with oat milk or almond milk or anything like that. Um, hickories are easy to grow in our climate and you can smash up the whole thing, shell, nut meat and all, and boil it in water, strain it out, and you can get most of the nutrition and most of the, the value of the nut out in, in that nut milk without having to bother to um, process the shells from the nut meat. Um, another large nut tree is the um, chestnut, and we used to have lots of wild chestnuts here before the chestnut blight about a hundred years ago. Um, and since then, people have mostly mostly been growing blight resistant hybrids, um, but there are lots of people working on blight resistant American chestnuts. So within a few years, hopefully those will be available to the public um, and hopefully we can see the American chestnut um, return to our landscapes in a big way. Um, chestnuts are an important food crop, I think, for, for the future um, because they can grow with so much less um, inputs than our current um, really calorie producing crops like corn and soy um, and they they kind of have a similar nutritional profile to uh, to corn and they're a reliably annually cropping uh, tree which is not true of 
the acorns um, and some other nut trees that often take take a year off. Um, so those are all big canopy trees. So if you wanted to plant um, a, a large tree, it's going to cast a lot of shade, uh, but also potentially um, create a, a lot of food and a lot of calories. Um, those are all good options. Um, this is a pretty terrible picture. It's not a uh, very high resolution, um, but of a much smaller tree. This is a cornelian cherry or cornus moss. Uh, it's actually an edible fruited dogwood. There's the fruit. They're really delicious. Um, I prefer these over true cherries um, because their pest and disease pressure is much, much lower. They're also much easier to collect and harvest. Um, most cherries need to be, on, on a home scale at least, picked individually and individually pitted, um, which is uh, worthwhile, but it's a lot of work. Um, Cornelian cherries will actually shake out of the tree by hand when they're fully ripe. So you can actually just lay a tarp under the tree, shake them out, um, and collect them very quickly that way. Um, and then instead of individually pitting them because there is a, a sizable seed in that fruit you can actually run them through um, a foley food mill one of those sort of cranky kitchen tools that you use to make um, applesauce and you get this amazing maroon puree that comes out of that uh, that makes excellent fruit leather um, preserves beverages uh, there's really a lot a lot that you can do with cornelian cherry and the, the the fruit is quite tasty out of hand as well and the, the trees are beautiful um, they're just starting to pop on my land uh, so very early bright yellow bloom um, just a little bit um, before the forsythia and it lasts like maybe another week after the forsythia uh, these are mulberries Mulberries are pretty common in lots of areas of the Midwest, especially in the Southeast, um, but are pretty rare here in Maine. Um, these are a variety called Illinois Everbearing, and they begin to ripen um, around I would say late June, and we usually have mulberries on that tree into the end of September. So they, it's a uh, it's called Everbearing for a reason, and they are delicious. Um, they kind of like a, a blackberry, um, but the seeds are much, much smaller. Um, so it's almost like a seedless blackberry. Very tasty. Uh, this is a pawpaw, and that's what the pawpaw looks like inside. Uh, pawpaw is North America's largest native fruit. Uh, it's a member of the Anonaceae family, um, so it has lots of tropical fruit relatives. Um, the flavor is kind of like halfway between a mango and a banana, and the fruit is very, or the pulp is really soft and custardy, uh, kind of like a ripe avocado. Um, they're also very low maintenance trees. Um, they're a little bit finicky to get established, but once they're established, um, the leaves are so full of um, these um, herbivore-deterring chemicals that um, even deer won't browse them in, unless they're starving. Um, so it it really, um, yeah, low a low maintenance fruit for sure once established. Um, and I'll just mention that uh, these trees are hardy in most parts of Maine, um, but our summers are just barely long and hot enough to ripen the fruit. So you really need to choose um, early ripening cultivars or seedlings of early ripening cultivars um, to ensure that they have enough um, time to ripen. These are the blossoms of a peach tree, very beautiful. And there's some of the resulting fruit. Um, Maine is really in a, a pretty sweet spot for peach cultivation, where our 
climate has warmed enough um, that the trees can survive and the fruit will ripen. Um, but a lot of the pests and diseases haven't really caught up with us uh, as much as they have in um, the South and mid-Atlantic states. Um, so peaches, they're also really fast to produce um, compared to most tree crops. So it's not unusual to plant a uh, peach tree and get a handful of fruit in two or three years and have a, a tree that's really producing a ton of fruit in four to five years. Um, this is a Madison peach in my yard that in its best year produced 150 pounds of peaches. Um, and one, one word of warning about starting to grow peaches is once you've had a tree ripened peach uh, from your own garden, you'll never be satisfied with a store-bought peach again. Um, there's really a whole, a whole different thing. Um, elderberries are a nice native fruit, um, pretty low maintenance, although some people do struggle with um, the birds eating all the, the elderberries before they get to them, um, which if I, it's not a problem I've had, but um, you can prune elderberries to be, you know, a fairly compact shrub and then net them if you if you really need to. That's what the fruit looks like. It's not good out of hand, but it makes delicious syrups, jams, jellies, and is um, um, a highly highly regarded medicinal fruit. Blueberries, also native to Maine, also pretty easy to grow. Um, delicious. Uh, the only thing that's really tricky about blueberries is they really like acid soil, um, which is usually fine because most soils in Maine are acid. Um, but if they're not acid enough, um, you'll notice the leaves um, yellowing in between the veins on the leaves. <clears throat> and that's a symptom called intervenal chlorosis and indicates a lack of iron. Um, and the way to solve that is to acidify the soil so that the iron becomes available. Um, and you do that using um, agricultural sulfur. Um, unfortunately, there's no amount of oak leaves or pine needles or any other organic material that people think of as acid that will actually acidify the soil. And the reason for that is um, the acids in those organic materials are all in the form of tannins, and tannins are very water-soluble and biodegradable, so they tend to wash away or break down pretty quickly. And by adding those high-carbon mulches, you build soil carbon, which is great. You should always be trying to build soil carbon, um, but any high-carbon soil tends towards neutral um, on the pH scale. So you can build up nice levels of soil carbon and actually end up de-acidifying your soil just by adding oak leaves and pine needles. So if, if you need to acidify your soil, sulfur is the way to do it, and it doesn't take very much. Um, there's many different types of um, cane fruit. Um, or rubus species that you can grow in your edible forest garden. Um, I personally love the flavor of red raspberries, um, but they do have this annoying habit of suckering all over the place. Um, and um, for that reason, I tend to favor black raspberries uh, for being lower maintenance. And black raspberries tend to spread by tip layering. Um, so if you trellis them a little bit and prune them so that the ends of the canes don't lay onto the ground, they tend to not spread very much. And I've got a question here that says, what about wood ash for acidity? Um, wood ash actually um, pushes the pH uh, pretty strongly in the opposite direction uh, towards alkaline. And the reason for that is that when you mix ash with water, it makes lye, which is uh, super alkaline. Um, 
And wood ash does have a lot of good mineral nutrition in it, um, which is great. But because of that lye factor, you always want to be um, very gentle with the amount of wood ash you put in any given area. So a sprinkle of wood ash is probably great unless you're trying to acidify that area. Um, but a lot of wood ash um, can just make the soil kind of caustic and it makes it hard for that soil biology that we want to foster um, to live. So <clears throat> uh, wood ash um, is great um, if you've got it and you spread it very widely, that's fine. Just don't overdo it. Um, this is one of my favorite vine crops. This is Shizandra chinensis. Um, the Chinese name is Wu Wei Zi, which means five flavor berry. Um, and this is probably the most flavorful fruit I've ever tasted. It's a really complex, really interesting flavor. I love it. I would say about 30% of the people who um, I have given these berries to didn't like it at all. Um, so I definitely recommend tasting tasting the fruit before you go ahead and plant one of these uh, but you know two-thirds of the people who tasted it did like it so um, you know for what it's worth um, they're quite easy to grow um, a little bit slow to start but once they get going um, they tend to start producing fairly young this one started producing after only three years um, and I've had uh, basically no pest or disease issues with these. Um, grapes are a little bit trickier to grow um, in our climate, uh, but the conquered type grapes, which are Vitus labrusca hybrids, um, tend to do quite well um, in our area. And not, not surprisingly, as they are native here, um, and grapes do seem to have a special affinity to growing with chickens. Um, so if you um, keep uh, chickens, consider trying to integrate a grape trellis with, with the chickens. Um, and there's some various reasons for that. I think a big one is that one of the primary pests of grapes uh, are Japanese beetles. And... Um, if you've got your grapes trellised over your chicken run, then if you just go out first thing in the morning and let the chickens out and give the grape vines a shake, all the Japanese beetle adults fall off and onto the ground and the chickens can eat them. And then also the Japanese beetles spend a significant part of their life as grubs in the soil. Um, and if those grubs are always getting dug up and eaten by chickens, that really puts a dent in the uh, Japanese beetle population. And then plus you've got all that chicken manure um, going into the soil around the grape roots. Um, so that, that does seem to be a nice, a nice way to integrate grapes into the landscape along with chickens. And one last vine crop. This is a uh, Colomnicta hardy kiwi. Um, this one's a male. It has that pretty variegated foliage. Um, hardy kiwis look like this. Um, they're smooth, about the size of a large grape, um, and really, really delicious. Um, I would say substantially more delicious than the fuzzy kiwis. Um, they are a bit of a commitment because the vines are super vigorous. So I always tell people that uh, when you plant a hardy kiwi, you're making a commitment to a lifetime of annual pruning. Um, so if, if you're not up for that, then I wouldn't plant them. Um, but they're definitely worth, worth the effort. Um, mushrooms are not plants, but they do integrate into an edible forest garden really well. Um, most of the actual material that's produced in a forest is inedible um, cellulose material like sticks and branches and leaves. Um, and 
mushrooms are able to convert that material directly into human edible food and they also um, are a high protein food and protein is something that's um, fairly scarce in in the forest garden um, so there's lots of different ways that you can grow mushrooms um, um, also mushrooms do not require uh, sun so in the shadiest uh, dampest parts of the forest garden is where mushrooms are likely to thrive the most and where not much uh, plant material would be able to be produced anyway. So these are shiitake <clears throat> mushrooms growing on logs. Um, and can't get too far into mushroom cultivation, but basically how, how this works is you take... Um, freshly cut or fairly freshly cut. It's actually ideal if they've been sitting for a couple weeks, but not too much longer. Um, hardwood logs, drill holes in them, and then the holes are filled with either sawdust spawn, uh, which is spawn with the mushroom mycelium growing in it, or plug spawn, which are like these little dowels that you would hammer into those holes. Then the holes are sealed with um, wax and the logs are left to um, have the mycelium grow through them and then later they can be uh, soaked in water to stimulate a flush of mushrooms coming out. Uh, these are Stropharia rugosa annulata or garden giant or wine cap mushrooms and these are much easier to naturalize um, in a garden setting. They grow really nicely in wood chip mulch. Um, so the way that you would grow these is as you're putting down a fresh mulch of wood chips, ideally hardwood um, wood chips, but mixed hard and soft wood is fine too. Um, you would mix in um, sawdust spawn. So that's sawdust with the mushroom mycelium growing in it. Um, and you would water that in really well and keep it watered for a couple weeks to help um, help the mushrooms start to get established. And then as long as there's woody material um, in, the, in that um, bed for the mushrooms to continue to digest, they'll tend to um, hang around for several years um, and um, push out a crop of mushrooms whenever the conditions are suitable which usually means a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of rainy days in a row in the spring and fall. Um, and you can get actually quite a large harvest of these portobello-like mushrooms from a garden bed inoculated um, with wine caps. I think I've got a, another question here. Uh, is the chicken run a good place for the hardy kiwis? thinking to train on the fence and it will be higher in nitrogen. Um, so that can work. Um, I've actually seen, seen that done. Um, and the, the case that I saw it done in, the kiwis got a bit out of hand and basically ate the chicken run. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, Grapes are pretty easy to trellis on a, on a chicken run. They don't tend to get out of hand quite as easily. Um, for kiwis, at least Arguda kiwis, which are the more common hardy kiwis, um, I, I do recommend like a purpose-built trellis that's just for the kiwis. Um, but you could probably get away with um, Colomicta or Arctic Beauty kiwis um, on a... Um, on a chicken run, you would just want to make sure that the the fence or whatever they're growing on is quite sturdy and pretty accessible so that you can get to it for an regular annual pruning. Um, one more thing on, um, on mushroom cultivation. Uh, we have a great resource here locally in Westbrook uh, with North Spore. Um, who is a uh, producer of mushroom spawn. So if you want to buy locally produced 
mushroom spawn to start some wine caps or shiitakes or many other species. Um, you can buy it from them. Um, and they have um, like informational videos on how to grow most of the species that they sell. Uh, on to some herbaceous layer plants. This is one of my favorite perennial vegetables. It's called Hablitzia. Um, it's a spinach relative that's much easier to grow than spinach in my experience. Um, grows great in part shade, very productive. Uh, but I also have some growing in what I would call full shade. It's not, you know, there's, there is some light filtering through the canopy, but it's completely underneath a large fruit tree. Um, and that does surprisingly well. Um, it is a vine. You can see it growing on a trellis here. Um, does great on like a garden fence, um, but it will also scramble across the ground and makes a really nice ground cover as well. That's just a close up of it. Um, this is a perennial vegetable called sea kale, more sorted, uh, suited to like a sunny edge. Um, I really like sea kale um, because it has a lot of different harvest windows and each harvest is pretty similar to a familiar crop. Uh, so the young leaves are very much like kale. The mature leaves are like collard greens. The flower buds are like broccoli and the immature seed pods taste like snap peas. Um, and the name of the mushroom company is North, like the direction, and Spore, like the reproductive structure of a mushroom, North Spore. Um, sea kale, obviously, also very pretty. Uh, asparagus does really well in, um, in the forest garden. You're probably uh, more familiar with asparagus than you are with most perennial vegetables, so I'm going to keep it moving. Um, this is a, um, a very easy to grow perennial vegetable called Turkish Rocket. Um, I really like these for a few reasons. Um, the early spring greens and the flower buds are super tasty. Um, the flower buds are a lot like broccoli rob, so kind of a broccoli flavor, but a little bit more bitter and a little bit spicy, um, kind of like mustardy greens. Um, and then these yellow flowers um, are very attractive to surfid flies, uh, which are our second largest group of beneficial insects here in Maine. Um, and they, they're a, a brassica that blooms quite early, um, so it kind of helps build up the population of those beneficials. Um, Turkish rocket grows as a large clump, um, but I would recommend deadheading this one as well, unless you uh, want it to spread, because they do tend to self-sow a bit. And another question, Stropharia rugosa annulata equals wine cap. Uh, that is correct. Uh, another name for them is garden giants, so they're all the same thing. Um, and it grows in a sunny garden, question mark. Um, they are one of the few mushrooms that actually will grow well in sun. Um, they are, I would say they grow even better in the shade, um, but as long as there's adequate moisture and uh, a regular application of wood chips, they seem to grow almost anywhere. Uh, we're starting to run low on time, so I'm gonna skip a few things. Um, alliums, perennial alliums, are a really nice addition to the forest garden. Um, this is my personal favorite. It's called mouse garlic. Um, I would say it's closest, of, of the familiar alliums, I would say it's closest to garlic chives, um, but it's larger. Um, I like the flavor better, and I think those big purple flowers are very pretty. Um, also very attractive to pollinators. Um, this is garden sorrel. Um, if you're not familiar with the flavor of sorrel, it's a sour flavor, very much like a lemon. Um, the variety of sorrel that I grow um, never goes to bloom. Um, so they're, 
some small leaves ready to harvest now. Um, and there'll be more and more leaves available through the season. And those will remain <clears throat> harvestable until uh, we get a killing frost in like probably early October. So it has a very, very long harvest season. Really tasty. Um, makes a great addition to salads. Um, some people really like sorrel soup. Um, and I really like to chop up um, sorrel leaves with garlic scapes and uh, stuff fish with that. I think that makes a really nice flavor combination. Um, these are stinging nettles. Here's another view. Um, some people uh, see nettles as a weed, but um, I see them as a really um, nutrient-dense medicinal vegetable, um, especially when they're at this stage. Um, you can just, with gloves usually, unless you want to get stung, grab a handful of them um, and just cook the whole thing because the young stems are so tender. Um, and once the nettle has been cooked or dried, the sting is deactivated. Um, and anything that you would use cooked spinach in um, is more nutritious and probably tastier uh, with nettles instead. I especially like them with um, any sort of egg dish. So um, sautéed nettles with scrambled eggs is really good. Um, makes a great frittata or quiche. Um, they're really nice, nice spring vegetable. I'll do one more vegetable. This is the flower and the root of Apios Americana, uh, the American groundnut. This is a native nitrogen fixing vine with edible flowers and edible roots. Um, they do especially well in really damp spots. Um, so if you've got a, a wet spot um, where most plants don't like to grow, this is one to consider. Um, the tubers are really nutty and unusually for a tuber, very high in protein. <coughs> well, we're coming up on two hours and that is the end of my slideshow. Um, and I'll leave you with a couple of uh, further reading suggestions and take any last questions before we wrap it up. Um, for starters, I, I always recommend Gaia's Garden as a really nice introduction <clears throat> to a lot of these concepts uh, that we've been talking about. Um, so if you want a fairly simple book to continue with, uh, Gaia's Garden is excellent. You can get it from um, the library as, as can as you can also get Edible Forest Gardens by Dave Jackie and Eric Tonesmeyer. Uh, these are more like textbook tomes, uh, but these are the books that really inspired me to get into Edible Forest Gardening. And there's a, a lifetime worth of reading and rereading in there. Uh, there's, they can be a little bit dense to just like read before bed, uh, but they're amazing reference books with a ton of really good, really important information. Uh, so if you want to get into some heavy details, I recommend those. And then Around the World in 80 Plants by my friend Stephen Barstow. Um, it's an excellent book uh, specifically about perennial vegetables and uh, what he calls edimentals or edible ornamental plants. Um, Stephen has a garden in Norway, that's the country of Norway, not Norway, Maine, um, where he has planted over 9,000 species of edible perennials. And his current garden um, is somewhere around 2,000 species. Um, so he's he's been experimenting with this for decades. Really interesting guy. And his book is um, very readable because he's not only talking about the plants and their culture, but he talks a lot about um, the history of human use of these plants 
and how they're used in the local cuisines in the places where they're native um, and the whole uh, whole book has a sort of overarching narrative of a a travelogue around the world um, sampling uh, perennial vegetables. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed uh, my presentation and um, feel free to get in touch with me by email or phone or text if you have um, questions later. And if you have any questions now, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask uh, any questions that you might have right now. Hi, Aaron. Hello. Hi. Earlier you were talking about um, water and creating places that will slow or hold some water for later use by the plants. In what kind of proximity to the garden area um, would be ideal for that? Um, so ideally, you would want to channel, um, channel the water as close to the plants that need it as possible. Um, and there's various ways to do that. Um, often using a swale or a ditch. So you can just kind of dig a little bit of a low spot um, so that the water can flow to where you want it to go. Um, although this can um, create issues with erosion. So if you're channeling a bunch of water to move across the landscape to go from point A to point B, um, you might need to line that with some stone to prevent, uh, prevent it from eroding and moving soil as as the water moves um, but generally um, just getting the water to stay in in the soil in your yard is going to be beneficial even if it's you know a hundred feet away um, rather than having it run off and completely leave the area i garden on a suburban lot in portland and one side of my house the south side it's not a huge area but it's where we garden and my lot also has sort of a little natural swale where the water runs kind of around that end of the yard so that sounds like it may be good but it also sounds like maybe i could dig some smaller ditches that come in towards the garden beds up near yeah. And then line it with some stone to help yep, me. Exactly. Yep. So it sounds like you've got a, a good a good setup and maybe you can improve the distribution a little bit. That's great to hear because I was always a bit concerned about, oh, I need to open that up so it can run off <laughs> away. So thank you so much for sharing about yeah, that. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Any last questions before we wrap it up? There's some in the in the comment section, Aaron. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, I'm turning on the, the uh, comment section. Um, question was, what was the first book of the three? And that is Edible Forest Gardens by Dave Jackie. Dave uh, J-A-C-K-E. Uh, and then Morgan's question was, what are your thoughts on planting in existing forest spaces in order to increase biodiversity? I'm wondering, oh, one sec, I have to figure out how to scroll up here. I'm wondering about the success of opening up spaces in the forest and planting near well-established trees, not wanting to till planting next to stumps. Um, I think that's a great idea, um, and I have seen it done very successfully. Um, and it's all about the right plants in the right space. Um, so uh, 
if if you're going to leave a essentially closed canopy, um, then you're probably going to work be working with mostly native shade loving plants, um, which um, have been largely removed um, from our woodlands here in Maine um, by you know centuries of basically bad forestry practices. Um, so if if you want to increase biodiversity in a existing woodland, I think um, removing a fair amount of trees so that you can get some dappled shade onto the ground is an important first step. Um, most of our woodlands um, are, you know, secondary or or, you know, has been cut many times and are super dense with trees and there's just not enough room and not enough light um, for that herbaceous layer to really grow very well. Um, so thinning the forest a bit, even uh, if you're going to be growing forest species, um, and then reintroducing with a, a real focus on native woodland species, I think would definitely be the, the most successful path. Um, or if you want to establish um, a forest garden with some of the more typical species, like the ones that I talked about, um, or, you know, sort of typical crop species, um, you're going to need to remove a larger number of trees um, so that you get some areas of full sun um, that you can kind of get um, the other, you know, the, the cropping plants more established in. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. And it looks like there might be one more question here. What type of canopy tree would best support elderberry? And is there any risk of planting them near foundations of homes or outbuildings? Um, I don't know that there is a particular canopy tree that would be best for elderberries. Um, elderberries are going to produce best in a sort of sunny edge. Um, they also like extra moisture. Um, so elderberries, I always tell people they don't want to grow in the swamp, but they would like to grow next to the swamp. Um, so if you've got a low wet area, planting elderberries around the edge is a great spot for them. Um, I don't think there's really any risk of planting them near a foundation of a home or outbuilding. Their roots aren't particularly invasive. Um, and because what you're harvesting is uh, the fruit of the plant, um, there shouldn't be any bioaccumulation of lead, uh, which is something to consider when um, planting around a foundation, especially if it's an old one. Um, so I think elderberries are quite quite well suited to that foundation planting. Uh, any ideas about a black walnut guild? Tricky, I've heard, but some things will grow around them. Um, so my experience with black walnuts um, is that most plants will grow pretty well around them. Um, they do create um, a, quite a bit of juglone, which is an allelopathic chemical that can suppress the growth of some plants. Um, but in, um, in highly bioactive soils, so soils that have um, a lot of good biology, that juglone seems to break down fairly rapidly and not be a problem for most plants. Um, I wouldn't try and plant like an annual vegetable garden um, under a black walnut, um, but you can do some experimentation and see what works and what doesn't. Uh, also in the uh, edible forest gardens, I believe it's volume two, there is a table of juglone tolerant plants. Um, so if you, if you want a list of plants that are known to um, tolerate um, being in polyculture with walnuts. That's a great place to look. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, 
one note about elderberry we put them right next to our house and the bald face hornets love them so be careful our honeybees ignored them that's a yeah uh, a good piece of information um Aaron, uh, I, I don't know. Yep. Yeah, I had a question. I have a plum tree that is four, possibly five years old. Um, it's full. It's the third year it's been full of blossoms. And this year was the first time we got any plums and it was five plums. And I'm wondering, we're we're not in downtown Portland, but we're right on the edge. And I'm. it's possible it's a pollinite pollinator problem um can i that pollinate that's certainly my plum tree possible. <laughs> and how uh, do i yeah. do it <laughs> do you do you only have one plum tree i have one plum tree and one cherry tree and they're close to each other and the cherry tree had significantly more fruit yeah okay so i would definitely plant another plum okay um if you're really tight on space, you could also just graft another plum variety onto the same tree. Okay. Um, and that might fix that problem. Okay. Um, but this this spring, you want to watch it real closely. Okay. And um, if it's if it's a pollination issue, mm -hmm. you'll get all those beautiful blooms, and then they'll fall off and leave nothing behind um so that that would indicate no, no pollination but there's also um an insect pest called plum curculio that's a really big problem for plums in maine so if you're getting little bitty tiny green fruit yes then, I did. then fall off okay yes. so that's that's plum curculio <sighs> um, <laughs> And luckily, there is a non-toxic control for it, okay. um, which is called Surround. And it's just powdered clay. And okay. you mix it with water and spray it on with a backpack sprayer. And you basically want the whole tree to be painted white with this clay dust. OK. Um, and you do that starting at petal fall for six weeks. and um, I, I had that same problem of like, oh, we're getting this amazing plum yes. fruit set, like a thousand plums. Yes. And then we get like one that ripens. Yes. It was very frustrating. Yes. And then the, the first year that we used Surround, we got like 50 plus pounds of plums off, okay. the, off a single tree. Do the cuculio, do they do anything to the tree? Because I do have a, uh, there is a little bit of a weird growth. No, uh, no the curculio oh, okay. only affects the fruit. Um, okay. But they, they also, they overwinter and they continue their life cycle underneath the tree. So picking up as many drops as you can, or if you have chickens, running chickens underneath the plum tree. Okay. Uh, both helps a lot. Thank you very much. Yep, yeah, you're welcome. And if, if you need more information on that, uh, The Holistic Orchard by Michael Phillips has a lot of great information. Okay, great. Um, all right. Are there any other species that you reviewed today that are also well-suited for planting on the edge of swamps or adjacent to small ponds? Um, so elderberries, um, groundnut, um, skirt, which is one of the plants that I skipped past, um, and that's Cium S-I-U-M Cisarum, which I don't remember how to spell, um, but that's another one for Skirit's American cousin, Hemlock Water Parsnip, uh, Cium Suave. Um, that'll actually grow in standing water. Um, cow Parsnip is another one that likes wet spots. Um, yeah. Willows often do well, which are not edible, but have lots of other nice properties. Um, yeah, that's those are the ones that come to mind first. 
any info on how to eradicate squash bugs? Um, I <laughs> have not had great success um, with eradicating squash bugs. Uh, I have yet to be able to attract any sort of insect that particularly likes to eat them. Um, if you have an area that's just um, squash, you might be able to successfully run chickens or other poultry through. Um, but my primary squash bug um, control method is I have a uh, like dust buster type vacuum, like a little handheld battery vacuum, and I go out at night with a headlamp and vacuum up all the squash bugs, um, which is kind of labor intensive, but better than squishing them by hand. Right, I'm going to scroll up and see if I missed any questions. All right. That might be it. Any any last questions? Um, yep. Planting on leach field. Um, so you can plant a garden over a leach field, um, but you don't want to plant anything woody um, because the roots of woody plants can reach down into the leach field and clog it up and make an awful mess. Um, so definitely don't want to do that. Um, but you can put, um, or yep, sunflowers would be totally fine on a leach field. Um, basically anything annual that doesn't have a crazy huge root system. Um, and if you're particularly concerned, you could build some raised beds um, on, on top of the leach, system, leach field system, and that would be totally safe. You're welcome. All right. Well, I think, uh, think we're going to leave it there for tonight. And if... Uh, if as soon as you sign off, you think of something or you think of something tomorrow, feel free to email it to me. And I hope you all have a nice night. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, like I just mentioned in the notes section, we will be sending out um, the video recording. So if there's anything you want to refer back to or um, answer further questions, uh, that will be available. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out for anything. Um, and also, Aaron sells many of the plants that he spoke about today on his website. I don't remember if he mentioned that, but oh, um, I, I didn't mention spring. that. That's, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned. <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, uh, I thought you might like that. Uh, I'll type the address of my website into uh, the chat box here. And um, you can order plants and seeds and all sorts of propagation materials online for shipping. Or if you're local, um, you can come pick stuff up uh, because of the pandemic. Um, I'm not having anybody sort of browsing the nursery, but you can call ahead and I can pack an order for, for pickup so you don't have to pay um, the shipping charge. And we will be hosting another webinar later this spring on edible landscaping. Um, so it'll touch on some similar things, but a little bit different. Um, and Aaron does also have a number of other upcoming events on his website as well. Uh, and the yeah. podcast. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing lots of, uh, lots of webinars and podcasts and stuff this spring um, because my all of my regular teaching gigs got canceled. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is actually kind of great for some people um, because it's all free, it's all accessible, and um, no matter where you live, um, you can, as long as you can log onto the internet, you can check it out. All right. Thanks, everyone. Just to send out some human connections. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
All Thanks right. Um, and I will add the information on signing up for our next course in the follow up email that I sent out. And I guess I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting now if nobody else has any other questions. So thank thanks, you. Jenna. Bye. Thanks. Bye.